number of people up front have been known to make mistakes, and it's my turn now. I'm sure I will. But we're looking at suffering encourages righteousness. What a delightful title, isn't it? Everybody's saying, good. I hope when I get done with this message, the Lord will bring me more suffering so I can have more righteousness. We really need to move ourselves back into this time. This has been Peter's theme. He's been saying, now, I know life is hard, and it's going to get worse. That's really his message. And it's going to get worse. Now, Peter wasn't necessarily uh, aware of what God's plan was. But anybody in this time could have been looking at all that was happening and could have known it's a bad situation, but it's going to get worse. We're not sure really how many people were gathering in these house churches where this letter went. But we know that every week, if they were able to meet every week, every week there was a new tragedy to pray about and to talk about. Because in this time period, the Christians are under an incredible amount of persecution. Perhaps they would get together and the group would be heartbroken because somebody was killed by their master. That could have been done and nothing would have been said or done about it by the authorities. Perhaps they were gathering together and a person was missing because they were too badly injured to make it. Because a, a horrible beating was within any master's ability to do without any repercussions. Perhaps there were some, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, where a young man or a young woman, a young boy or a young girl would come. And there would be tremendous sorrow because their innocence was sacrificed because of the want of somebody who had more power and more authority. I mean, this is a difficult time to live in. This is a difficult place to learn how to live out your Christian faith. So when Peter writes, he keeps repeating a couple of things. He keeps repeating, oh, you just, if you want to know how valuable you are to God, realize that God brought your salvation with the precious blood of Christ. Blood without any blemish. He says, listen, if you want to know what things are going to be like, you're living as strangers in a foreign land. It's hard, it's difficult, but don't worry. There's a day coming when you will be home, but this is not home. And then he keeps saying, listen, you keep the right attitude. You keep obeying the God-ordained authorities no matter what they say, no matter what they do, because in doing that, you're living your life the way the Lord Jesus lived his. So now Peter is coming back to that theme. I've tried to use a number of the verses found in 1 Peter because you'll see that the theme is it's being overlaid one on top of the other. So let's look at the introduction, and it comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. At the beginning of the letter, Peter wrote, says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor to the, on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. 1 Peter 3, 22. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and, and powers accept his authority. So Peter, in our introduction, mentions a couple of things. Every time you go through a trial, you may wonder, why is this happening to me? And, and if we would review just a little bit how it would happen with the ore found in a gold mine, 
It's dirty. There's nothing in it that's spectacular. But you put it into a, a heavy metal container with an intense fire under it, and it begins to bubble as that gold ore begins to molt. And then slowly but surely, the impurities come to the top, and the goldsmith would carefully skim it away and pour away that slag. And again, increasing the heat, a different kind, of, but another impurity would come to the top, and again, time after time, until the gold was shimmering. And the goldsmith could lean over and look into this pot and see his reflection. And then he would say, now the gold is pure. It's ready to be made into beautiful jewelry. And Peter says, don't you be deceived. You're not experiencing troubles because you've done something wrong. You're not experiencing troubles because you're unfortunate, unlucky. No, what's happening, you may not understand why. There are a lot of things that we just don't understand. But in the process of suffering, there is a great work being done. And then the other point I make in using 1 Peter 3 is this. Jesus has already been through this same experience that we are going through. And he is seated right now as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, seated at the right hand of the Father. And he has all authority. Now we wonder about what's happening, but we are given the assurance that there is a day coming when all the world will see and recognize him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. So let's go back to this theme of suffering. What good is occurring when we suffer? What noble work is being accomplished when we go through difficulties, be they physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, circumstantial? Let's take a look. Number one, suffering encourages us to identify with Christ. Now we experience that all the time. Maybe you're someplace where you, uh, you don't know anybody Every once in a while, when we were in Brazil, we would see somebody walking the streets of our city, and they'd have an American t-shirt. Now, that didn't mean anything, but if they had a t-shirt with the name of a church on it, then we'd go up and we'd say, excuse me, would you be an American? Yes. Oh, as soon as they said they were an American, we said, oh, there was a fellowship we enjoyed. And when we found out they were a Christian, oh, there was an even greater fellowship we enjoyed. It's a little bit like being on a trip and, and just striking up a conversation with somebody and you find out they're from the same town you're from. Now that wouldn't be Fulton, we'd know those people, but maybe they say we're from Rochester. And we'd say, oh yeah, Beth and I on our one and only cruise, which was very nice, we were standing in line. And my wife says this all the time. Hey, if you wanna talk, I'm here. But I, I like talking to strangers because they'll still laugh at my jokes. She will not. I mean, she's heard them all. She doesn't even, it's hard, you can imagine. But I love talking to strangers because they'll still laugh at my jokes. And we're standing there talking to somebody and oh, one thing led to the other in the conversation. And pretty soon he said, I used to spend every summer in Rochester. I said, Rochester, yeah, on the lake. And he told me about where he, lay, he lived and his grandfather lived there. And oh, we felt like we were the best of friends in about 10 minutes because we could identify with each other. Suffering encourages us to identify with Christ. Because no matter what we've been through, he's been through more. But there's a fellowship we enjoy. Let's start looking at the passage in 1 Peter chapter 4. And you'll notice that everything from our passage today, verses 1 through 6, are in italicized and underlined. So you can follow them as we read through. But the verse starts off, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain... Now, that's a theme that Peter has already mentioned. Look at it in 
chapter 2, verse 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example. You must follow in his steps. So when I'm going through a difficulty, when you are going through a difficulty, you are suffering. There is a special fellowship we can have with Christ. Because there's no one that can understand what we're going through, but he does. And he encourages us. But suffering does more than just help us to identify with Christ. Number two, suffering encourages us to put on the mind of Christ. The rest of that verse starts off, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. Isn't that good news? If you're going to live in this world, guess what? You're going to suffer. So put on the same attitude, put on the same mind that Christ had. Here's how the book of Hebrews tells us. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. If you've been involved in sports, you've probably heard or maybe been a part of a conversation like this where the coach is saying, no, I, don't, I want you to change your shot. I want you to do it differently. I want you to run like this. And oftentimes the, the ball player, especially a young, inexperienced ball player or athlete, will say, no, no, I don't do it that way. That's not the way I do it. And then there's this little tug of war that happens between the coach and the player. And it might even become a bit intense where the coach says, hey, you do it my way or you're going to sit on the bench. This is the way I want you to do. What he's really saying to the player is, what I want you to do is I want you to put on my way of thinking. I want you to have the same attitude that I have in this regard. If you're going to be a part of a team, then all of us need to operate under one head, one coach, one leader. Suffering teaches me to put on the mind of Christ. Says Peter, listen, Christ suffered. You're going to suffer. You put on the attitude that Christ had. Because God blessed that attitude. The Father honored that willingness to suffer for righteousness sake. Number three, suffering weans us from our appetite for sin. That's a word we don't use as often anymore, but it's a great word. Suffering weans us from our appetite for sin. Let me start up and read the whole verse so we have the context. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. Well, what on earth does that mean? Does that mean I'll no longer have a desire for sin? I'll no longer be a, a part of a sinful lifestyle just because I have suffered? And there is something that changes us when we suffer. What Peter says is, listen, because you are suffering it will wean you away from your desire for sin. Now, I can give testimony that no amount of suffering will ever make sin disappear as the enemy, as the allurement. But here's what's happening. Now, I've got to go back a long time for this. Way back when our older kids were in the home, my wife was able to breastfeed them. And it was really a positive experience for our family. Until the day came when my wife said, they have too many teeth. <laughs> it's time to wean them. I don't know if you've ever been through that experience of weaning your child. Oh, my. We set up a schedule where they would only nurse for a certain amount of time. 
And then mom would go away, and it would be my job to take care of the baby. And I would try to give him a bottle to finish the rest of the job. Wasn't working. Finally, it was time to put them in bed. On many a night, I was asleep on the floor with my arm inside the crib, patting a crying baby. Why? Because the baby wanted mom. But it was important that we wean the child away from the mother's milk. It was a long and difficult process. Sometimes we look at Christians who have been through an incredible amount of heartache. And there's something that we'll notice, and that is they are different because of the heartache, because of the suffering. I really believe that when we are in heaven and we're walking and introducing ourselves to people, we're going to see some people who have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. We're going to see those who have been martyred because of their faith in Christ. And I really believe that we're going to look at these people like they are indeed superstars because they are. Because they have been changed by their suffering. And there is a righteousness that is brought into their lives because they have suffered greatly. Let's read the rest of those verses. 1 Peter 2, 24. Speaking of Christ, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Paul said something very similar in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. We are living, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, I do not want you to think that experientially that I can tell you, oh, there's a day coming when sin will no longer have its allurement. It will always have an alluring influence with us. We'll always want to see just what would it be like. We'll be tempted to reach in and just touch it, to grab it. But God, in allowing suffering to come into our lives, what he slowly does is he changes our appetite to where we're saying, I don't know why I keep going back to that same place of sin. Because all I do is come away with the same belly ache I had the last time. I'm sicker about it this time than I was the last time. And through the suffering, some of which we invite into our lives with our disobedience, but through the suffering that comes in, it's not long until we are changed. Because we know that Christ died for our sins. Not only to pay the penalty, but he died so that the power of sin might be broken. Suffering weans us from our appetite for sin. Number four, suffering reminds us that life is short. He starts a new paragraph. He says, you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. When you are born again, things change in your life. You are made a new creature, a new creation. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Again, someone in that audience might have said, would you read it earlier? Paul or Peter said something about that earlier. And here's what he said in 1 Peter 1. Of course, they didn't have the chapters or the verses marked in their edition. They just had a, a regular letter. But here's what it said. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. 
You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. For even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You see, there's a day coming when this short life will be over and all of us will stand before God. Now, there are a number of judgments in the Bible. We're not going to look at all of those. That song we sang today speaks of, of the great comfort we have. We will not need to answer for anything we've said or done in this life if we're a Christian in the sense of sin and its punishment because Jesus took care of all of that on the cross. He said, it is finished. So sometimes we'll say, well, I don't want to answer to the Lord for that. Speaking of someone's sin. Well, that's covered by the cross and we say amen to that. But there is an opportunity that is ours every day. And there is a scorecard that is kept in that sense of, did we use the opportunity of this day to serve Christ? Or were we fooled once again and we lost the day because we followed after the scent of sin? Years ago, we had a dog. Now, we've had a number of dogs. And I know those of you who are dog lovers will hate to hear this, but I praise the Lord that all of our dogs are gone. Thank you to the Degs. All right, they took the last dog. If something happens to my wife and I, and we say, oh, we need to have another little dog. Would you enter us both into counseling? Because we're drinking something you don't know about. <laughs> because we're not doing that again. One time, Caleb had a dog. Shadrach was the dog's name, I think, and it was part hound of some sort. And all it had to do was catch one scent. And there are rabbits everywhere in this town. I don't remember if that was the dog's name, but I remember we had, it was a cute puppy. They're all cute as puppies. And you could not walk the dog because it pull and jerk. And once it got away, it didn't matter how many times you called its name. It had the scent and it was chasing after the scent. Unfortunately, we lose many opportunities of service because we get the scent of something that is wrong. And I just want to see where it leads and we follow after it. Now there is that accounting where we stand before the Lord and we give an account on how we have done with all that he gave us in the way of time and talent and opportunities. But there is a judgment that others will experience. Those who reject, those who will not receive Christ, there is a day that's coming when they will stand before the Lord and perhaps they will want to give an explanation. But, but Lord, oh judge, you don't understand. I was better than so-and-so. I was more righteous in my own way than those people at that church or this other church. And all of that might happen, but the judge will silence every single disobedient soul with, I know what you've done. There's no denying the facts. You lived your life in rebellion to the grace and the word of God. The judgment will come. Peter says to these people, listen, those people who are judging you now, who are punishing you because you desire to do what is righteous, don't you worry. Life is short. There's a day coming when they will answer for every deed they did against you. Number five, suffering reminds us that God's judgment is certain. He goes on with that in verse 4. He says, of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. 
so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, that they now live forever with God in the Spirit. All of these people in these little house churches that were scattered throughout Rome, all of them knew somebody, no doubt. They knew somebody who had died because of their faith. It was becoming a common practice. In just a couple of years, all of the people of Rome were going to herd the Christians into the Colosseum. And there they would die by the hundreds because of their righteousness. Because of their unwillingness to bow before an idol. Because they knew and loved the Savior. So this was something they were experiencing. And Peter said, listen, just because your friends are surprised. And just because they've turned against you. Because you won't do what you used to do. Don't you worry. There are some in your midst. And because they heard the gospel and responded to it. They're alive now. They're in the presence of God now. They have received their reward now. 1 Peter 1.17, Peter had written these words. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And here's the conclusion. In 1 Peter 2.15, we've already studied it, but let's look at it again. It is God's will. Now that's mentioned a number of times in the Bible when the writers will say, it is the will of God. Those are places we need to mark down. Because there are times when we may not want, can a Christian do this or can they do that? Should they do this or should they do that? But there are certain places where God's word is very clear. He said, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is my will. This is how you please me. And right here, it's very clear. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. If we are determined to live righteously, if we are determined to live in a way that will honor our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can be assured of this. There are many in this world who will misunderstand what we do and why. Every once in a while, someone will ask me, don't you get tired of what some people say about you? Believe it or not, there are people who don't like me. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Because I'll have to, when they come into my office or when they ask my opinion, I have to confront them with what is, in their understanding, their sin. And every once in a while, friends will turn and they'll no longer be friends and people will say, Aren't you worried about what other people think or say? And I say honestly, no, there are over 7 billion people in the world. I can't make them all happy. It's a very small group of people that I want to please. On the very top of that list is my Heavenly Father, my Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit that resides within, the people that I worship and fellowship with. Those are the people who it matters to me what they think. We will be called to suffer if we desire to live righteously. And if we live righteously, the suffering that comes from that will do a profound work in our hearts. So Peter says, don't give up. 
Don't give in. Don't quit. The worse it gets, the more profound the work is, and that work will stand as a testimony for all eternity. Live an honorable life. That is God's will. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? With any of these passages, there, there is always much more to be found. I've desired to give you the main idea of the paragraphs. Because we need to live by the main ideas. Here it is. This world is unkind. It's unfair. People will turn against you. When you walk with Christ, you will no longer walk with the world, which means many of your friends will no longer walk by your side. The more you are determined to do what is right, the more it will cost you. But the more you suffer, the more profound will be the work that God does in your heart. And when we live like that, it pleases the Savior. I need to ask, I'm not going to prolong it, but I need to ask, what is your determination today? Maybe today's the right day to say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful starting this very day. I'm going to get back into reading the Bible. I know that when I drift away from that, my life turns south. I'm going to make it a priority to read my Bible. I'm going to order my schedule so that I can pray every day and fellowship with you and be responsible to care for my family as I stand bowed before the throne. Lord, I'm giving you this new week. You can change circumstances any way you want. I've already determined today that I will faithfully serve you no matter what it costs no matter what it does in my life. It's amazing. The more we suffer, the more determined we become. It's a lot like lifting weights. The more it hurts, the stronger we get. And if we stay faithful to that routine, a great work is done. Indeed, a great work is being done in our souls if we are determined to live an honorable life because that is God's will. Father, I'm, I am so thankful that you are so incredibly patient with us. That so many times you've come to me and I know others would give the same testimony. You've come to us after you've broken us and you've said, now listen, this is the right way. Let's walk this way. And Father, we are prone to wander like our hymn says. And yet, Lord, you patiently break us, bring us back, start all over again in building a brand new testimony, in building new character into our lives. Father, I thank you that nothing is wasted in this life, not a single horrible, unfair, unjust experience but, Father, that you use it to build us into one who will be more like Christ with each passing day. Father, I'm asking that you would do that in all of our lives, in this church, through our ministries. And I ask for this as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Maybe next week we'll have something better than suffering. But no, no, Peter's going to talk more about it. Thank you so much.